In our Bibles to our, our scripture for this Sunday evenings, <coughs> we are in, <coughs> not 1 Corinthians, we're in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm going to read the whole chapter, we, uh, 18 verses, though we may not cover it, cover it all this evening. Hebrews chapter 2 says, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You have made him for a little while, little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honour, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honour because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sins to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies, and those who are sanctified, all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the, ch I and the children God, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. May the Lord bless his word to us this evening. As we're going through the book of Hebrews, we are seeing a few simple truths in here, how that it is a book that tells us about the supremacy of things, the supremacy of God's Son in chapter 1, and here in chapter 2 we read about the supremacy of that gospel message. It is also a book of warnings, warnings of dangers that are to come which start in chapter 2, we see the danger of drifting from the gospel. In chapter 3, we will see the danger of disbelieving the gospel. In chapter 5, the danger of defecting from the gospel. And then in chapter 10, the danger of disparaging. And then in chapter 12, the danger of declining the gospel. So, although this book is labelled a letter to the Hebrews, we have to remember that those Hebrews it was addressed to were those early Christians we read about in the at the start of the book of Acts. So that first section there, the warning against neglecting salvation or the supremacy of the gospel message. Verse 1, he says, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it to pay closer attention to the gospel message. Not just to hear it, not just to read it, but to study it and to live it. Just like James says, to be doers of the word and not listeners, hearers only. 
Jesus has told us to be quick to hear. He has told us that He said, he said to the, the Pharisees, have you not heard? Have you not read? He said, there is an, a great importance placed upon paying close attention to the gospel message so that we don't have that danger of drifting away. And of course, when we speak about drifting away, we must remember that, no, we cannot lose our salvation, but we can lose fellowship. Think of the prodigal son. When the prodigal son drifted away of his own accord, he didn't at any time stop being the son, but he did stop that fellowship. And then when he returned, his father was there waiting for him. It's a great blessing that we have, but also a warning lest we drift away. In Hebrews, Paul discusses that in detail a, a bit later on. In verse 2, he says, For since the message declared by angels, those angels he addressed in the first chapter, proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. That message that the angels brought, that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai, that was the law of Moses. This law of Moses presented the coming Messiah. That's the whole message of the law, was that the Messiah was coming, and they, should, they had to listen to that. The law convicts, though, because no man can keep that law of Moses. Nobody can keep the law. And they, thus, by that law, all are condemned. And this is a great problem we have in today's society when people say we need to come back under the law, we need to come back under legalism, we need to start working for our salvation, or we need a works-based religion, because that's basically what the law was. It was to work for your faith. But they couldn't work for their faith. They needed to have the faith of Abraham. And this caused them to be condemned. He says in verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Only the gospel of salvation leads to righteousness. Nothing else places us in that position. Nothing else gives us the righteousness that we need before God. How shall we escape hell and damnation? How shall we escape, escape the wrath of God as we saw this morning if we neglect such a great salvation? And it's not just a minor thing. It's not, just, uh, it's not a plaster over, over a problem. It's the solution to all of sin. It is a great salvation. It is a salvation that is not deserved by any of us, yet it's freely given by God. It's there. It's available. He carried on in verse 3. He says, it was declared at first by the Lord, was attested to us by those who heard. The gospel was spoken by Jesus. In fact, Jesus was the gospel message. He was that good news. He was the illustrated edition of God's word, walking amongst us, dwelling amongst us. He was the express, express image of the good news of salvation. He taught it to his apostles as he carried on. It was attested to us. It was proven to us. Not only did we hear him speak the gospel message, but we saw him live the gospel message. Everything that he did was evidence of that gospel message. And it was attested to us by those who heard his very voice. We have not heard the voice of God. We've not heard the voice of Christ. We've not seen him. We've not, we've not touched him. But we have an inheritance. Perhaps those who witnessed to us never saw Christ. Those that witnessed to them, going back as far as you can, but at some point, somebody, whether he was an apostle or one of his disciples, heard Jesus speak and passed that message on. And that's the message that we have today. We play a game with our kids sometimes called Chinese Whispers and we get it wrong when we get to the end of the line. But this message doesn't, is never wrong. It's the same message that Christ spoke that we have today. It was attested to us by those who heard. That is the important thing. We hear the voice of Christ through those who witness to us 
because they're witnessing to us from his word. Jesus, then his apostles, then his disciples, and now us. And from us, who else is going to hear the calling of Jesus Christ? Who else is going to hear that voice that was first, first spoken to an apostle or a disciple, passed down to us so we can speak it to others? That's something we need to look to, to make sure that we are passing that message on to the others. And in verse 4, he gives us an example, the evidence of that gospel given by God. The physical evidence that those who saw, those who heard, actually experienced. It carries on in verse, the, center, the verse carries on. Verse 4, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It is God that gave Jesus the authority to perform those miracles. Because God and Jesus were one and the same. It was Jesus who gave his apostles the authority to do those miracles, th th those signs and wonders and various miracles. And all of these by that gift of the Holy Spirit. We often wonder, is it available to us to give signs, to show wonders and perform miracles by the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, not as the apostles did. But when you change somebody's life because of the gospel message that you preach to them, when you restore somebody from the path of sin and damnation that they were on, when you save somebody from suicide or drinking or whatever it is because of the gospel message, there's a miracle in that person's life. They have been changed from the old man to the new man. They have been saved from the, from the, the very precipice of hell and damnation because you went to them with the word of the gospel. Without that, they would be damned for eternity. That's a miracle in itself. The miracle that he has given us of his Holy Spirit to, to attest to his words. In verse 5, the founder of salvation is God through Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus Christ said, there is no there is no way to God except through me. He says in verse 5, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. That world to come, that is our blessed hope that we learnt about this morning. It's subjected to Christ, first of all. Look at chapter 1 and verse 13. Chapter 1 and verse 13, there it says, And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. The whole world will be his footstool. All of his enemies, all those that hate him, they will all be subjected to Christ. We are already subject to Christ. When he comes that second time, he will already have taken us up into glory, saved us from the wrath to come. It's a, a promised rest as well. Ch chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, the promise of entering his rest still stands, but it's still available to people right to that last moment. He said, he carried on, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not, they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest, therefore, since therefore it remains for some to enter it. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did. That is the day that is to come. That is that promised rest that all everything we are going through now 
the day of rest is coming when Jesus Christ returns, where we are, we are in his presence, in that kingdom of glory. It's also a heavenly country that we're waiting for. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11, uh, verse 16. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. We have a heavenly country, we have a heavenly city, a city that is still to come. But all of this has already been provided for us, because what did Jesus say? He said, I go to prepare a place for you, and where I go, I will return and I will take you back with me. So this is that world that is to come, that was not subjected to angels, but subjected to his son, Jesus Christ of which we are speaking. He says in verse 6, it has been testified somewhere. And this is a quote from Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 and 6. He says, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honour, putting everything in subjection under his feet. This is a piece of Scripture, uh, the psalm here that addresses two, su two subjects at once. It addresses the mortal man. What is man that you are mindful of him? But he also addresses the immortal man, Jesus Christ, or the son of man, that you care for him. And both of those follow through in the, the other two verses. What is man that you are mindful of him? You have made him a little while lower than the angels when we sit when we are in the glories of heaven, we are at the right hand of God. We made, uh, we made heirs with Jesus Christ. You have crowned him with glory and honour. When God created Adam and Eve, he set them in a garden in Eden. We, have the, we bear that image of God. We are crowned with that glory and honour uh, honor of God. And he's put everything in subjection under our feet. But he also, more than that, applies to Jesus Christ. Or the Son of Man. That phrase often used to express uh, the natural, uh, physical uh, meekness of, of Jesus Christ. He said, Or the Son of Man, that you care for him. You have made him, Jesus Christ, for a little while, while lower than the angels. And he sent him down to be born of a virgin. You have crowned him with glory and honour. We will see that at the end time. We will see him crowned with that glory and honour. And at that point, everything will be in subjection under his feet. Indeed, everything now is in subjection under his feet. Only he's allowing the time to carry on. Man was to have dominion over the earth. This is the, what we were given. This is why we were placed upon this earth in, in Genesis. But Satan stopped that by beguiling Eve. But Christ has come to fulfill what Adam could not. That when he sets his foot down the second time upon this earth, he will have dominion over all things. Everything that is against us now, all the problems and terrors and horrors of this world, all the sin that we see every day, one day will be put to rest. Because he will finally have authority over all of it. He carried on in verse 8. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control at present. Nothing outside his control. At present we do not see everything in subjection to him. See this is what the world does not realise. That they may deny Christ, they may reject him, they may call him a liar, may even deny his very existence. But nothing is outside of his, his authority. Nothing has been left outside of his control. Even those who do not believe in him, even those, unfortunately, who have not heard of him, none of it is out of his control. Yet at present, right now, we have not seen everything in subjection to him. We have not seen all people bowing the knee, professing with their tongues that he is the, he is the Lord. One day that will happen. There are people of this world who have yet to become subject to his will. 
And the only way that will happen is if we profess the gospel message. Verse 9 says, but we see him, Jesus Christ, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, takes us all the way back to verse 7. You have made him, Jesus, a little while lower than the angels. But we see him, and we will see him, the world will see him, but we see him now, because we are saved, we are Christians. We see him crowned with glory and honour. And we see this glory and this honour because he, of the suffering of death that he faced on our, on our behalf. He says, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. The Son shared our humanity so that we could share his glory. He came down to earth to be one of us so that he could take us to be with him. We remember that Jesus Christ died upon the cross as we die with him, but he rose again so that we rise with him. There are people... Uh, the, the Son shared our humanity so we could share His glory. Not that God did not understand death. And it says at the end, so that by the grace of God He might taste death for everyone. That doesn't mean that God did not understand death. That God did not has never felt that. God created it. And He created it for a reason. But that He tasted death that we should not have to taste that. He tasted the bitterness of death in our place. The death spoken of here is not just is not physical death. Every man will die. But it's that second spiritual death when we're cast out of the presence of God. We will never face that. We will never have that condemnation. Father, thank you, Lord, for the blessing of your holy word. We thank you, Lord, for the teachings that are in there that prove to us, Lord, that your word is true and faithful and just. And that, Father, we can come before you and our faith is counted as our righteousness so that we receive that blessing of salvation and in our hearts is placed your Holy Spirit. Father, help us to profess your word, to teach your gospel message so that when Christ spoke those words to the apostles, to the disciples, that word that they passed down through the generations will continue to be passed down through us to those who at this moment are condemned, yet have the availability of salvation. We ask this in your blessed name. Amen. Amen. Jane, can you stop the recording, please?